Joined now by our Friday regular NHL insider from the Daily Faceoff, the Frankly Speaking podcast, Mr. Frank Saravelli. Got a baseball team in the NLCS. He's got a pretty good hockey team in his town right now as well. How about Taurus? FIFA soccer. Philly's oh been God. Philly's been off the You're hook the lately. Hub of yeah. North American sports right now, Frank. Just ask. Uh, I, I gave. I, I ran into an extra pair of tickets at the NLCS game the other night. The Canucks happened to be in town. I hit up a, a Thomas Drance, and he was able to go to the game. He texted me yesterday and said he still is like can't get Philly out of his head. That's how much he enjoyed being mm -hmm. in town. So I was like, huh, see, someone had good vibes in this town for once, and maybe they can tell people about well, we, it. We, we've had a great time, uh, you know, attending uh, Philly's games. It's like, yeah. I love Philly as a sports town. Well, and you've got a reputation of being this tough, merciless sports crowd, and yet the Phillies games look like just the biggest party going right now. They are. It's It's been unbelievable, the, the energy, vibes, and – it's it takes over a whole city like everything starts to not really feel as bad when your team goes on a run like that it's two three four weeks of of euphoria it's been amazing to be around All right, before we and, get off philly of course sunday night they're hosting the game in the nfl weekend uh dolphins it, and eagles too. five and one are, are people starting to fall in love with torts's flyers here too after these big wins i don't think so because i nope. think everyone knows in the grand scheme of the nhl picture of where they are but here's the thing that i thought was super interesting and i was at the flyers game last night they had a lifeless oiler team that was in town and to see the reaction from jay woodcroft who dropped an f-bomb he was so frustrated with his team's play and then to compare and contrast that to Rick Tockett 48 hours earlier in the same building, the common thread there, and I said this to you guys a couple weeks ago, is that if you show up to Philly and you play the Flyers this year and you don't bring your hard hat and your lunch pail, good luck. Mm -hmm. They're definitely not the most talented team in the league. They're way short on that and actually by design. But – that's why I said John Tortorella is the worst coach for this team. You get Sean Couturier <laughs> back and Cam Atkinson, and all of a sudden you have a team that has, you know, a bit of an edge to it. They're not going to be a free space on the bingo card. And if you come into town, and I love, that's why I love so much the reaction from Rick Tockett. Who are we? Yeah. After what the last few years have been like in Vancouver, use the word soft. Mm. That's like, that's, that's like, the worst thing you can say about a hockey player or team. Mm -hmm. And it's and he, true. That's what's that's I, I've been saying it to you guys. The Canucks have been easy to play against. Yes. Do not go down that path. Don't feel good about winning two games against the oil to start. And, and, th and we've been hearing this for several years, Frank, like there are guys in that room who, you know, think they're better than what they are. And in some cases have treated the NHL as a finishing line, not a, not a starting gate. Of course, Torts has their attention because it's early in the season. And so well well done to the Flyers for the effort here over the last couple of, of games against uh, Vancouver and Edmonton. That's how you're going to endear yourself to a market. Yeah. Talk it was more nurturing last night. And this is one of the questions I wanted to ask you about him because you know him pretty well is I think there will be nights where he just can't help himself like Tuesday. But I think you'll know that the Vancouver Canucks are in a better place when he's addressing losses as he did last night, commending the effort, saying, look, the penalty kill was better than what the actual results were. And being asked pointed questions about guys who have really struggled like Tyler Myers and yet making an effort to build them up a little bit. I think there's this visceral reaction that you'll get from Rick Tockett. And we we actually spoke about this a few weeks ago when we were working through his interview with me on frankly speaking that sort of second game into his tenure he's outside in vancouver mumbling to himself on a street corner at two in the morning it was game two and then he sort of had to get cracked back into line I, it's the competitive nature that he has um and there are a few things that there are a few things that he just doesn't tolerate um attention to detail and body language and work ethic. Like those are the non-negotiables you're going to, the hockey's a game of mistakes. Like you're going to make a ton of mistakes throughout the course of the season. He can live with that, but he can't live with not showing up to work. And 
when you so, you sort of see that gut reaction right away, then like someone kind of has to take him and like you know get him back on the straight and narrow to say, hey, this is not a four game fix for the Vancouver Canucks. This is a multi layered process and approach that they're working towards that I think you then see some of that come out the next game. They got a little bit more truculence with Mark Friedman, um, albeit, you know, not a true National Hockey League defenseman by any stretch, but they throw him right into the mix and he sort of got into a fight. He he got into a reception uh, more than he got into a fight. Um, You know, does that... Truculence is definitely not one way I would explain Mark Friedman, but sure. Yeah, I, you're right. He, he, I think he'd like to be truculent, but by all accounts, he, uh, what we saw last night is sort of more his calling. How card. would you describe him then, Frank? Yeah, yeah. You sure? What are your ideas? You've seen him more than yeah. us. Yeah. So I, I watched him. Well, he started actually here in Philly, and then watched him a bit in Pittsburgh. He was a Ron Hextall guy that he brought over, and he's someone that actually skates really well. Um, he's pretty gifted with the puck. Um but he's got some inefficiencies in his game that have really kept him from being a full-time NHLer. There have been varying points in his career that people have advocated, hey, give this guy a longer runway and term uh, to really show what he's got, but they can't really live with the mistakes and defensive zone issues that pop up that you know make him hard to keep in the lineup on a nightly basis. So I'd actually like to see him get a little bit more shot, especially with the puck, because I think he's got some talent. Um, and he's definitely not afraid, but I would never say truculence. Is uh, is is there another solution here for the Vancouver Canucks as you see it? Like, are, do you think a defenseman is part of their search with regards to to Connor Garland, for instance? Uh, is is there more than Friedman coming here for the Canucks? In, in an ideal world, yes. In an ideal world, if you had the cap space and flexibility you'd be able to grab one of the guys from Columbus that's been out there and in the mix. Um, This is kind of going back to what I was talking about roster construction wise preseason for the Canucks. And I thought they did a great job addressing it in the off season, the Susie injury, you know, kind of hurt to start, but you know, you take out and you look at what they were dealing with last season and you had guys four to six in your lineup on a nightly basis that are, really what I would say not to disparage anyone fringe NHL players to be able to cut that back down this season to one and have him play consistently to start in Juleson is, you know, you try and limit that as much as you can. You'd much rather have that guy be your seven injuries and everything else that pops up changes what that dynamic looks like. But if you can, you know, sort of slowly cut that out, it's hard to do it all in one fell swoop like the Canucks have tried to do this past off season. So it's going to constantly be a, um, you know, sort of a, a daily look at your lineup card. And is this guy better than what we have? Is this guy the same as what we have? And I would say when you're talking about Mark Friedman, you're talking about a 5% improvement on Juleson. You're talking right. about, a, you're, you know, you're just trying to find someone to plug that hole for now until you can get to where you want to get to. Uh, I saw you tweet about this earlier. Of course, we have the ex-Penguins management group here, and Friedman makes now five ex-Penguins that are right now with the Vancouver Canucks alongside Bluger, Cole, DeSmith, and Sam Lafferty. We heard a lot about this when Rutherford and then Alvin was hired, Frank, and I want your two cents on it. One, is it even possible to repeat the formula in Pittsburgh given that Rutherford and Alvin had... Sydney and Malkin there, not to mention Mark Andre Fleury and Chris Letang. And two, when you take a look at the way that the team was managed, particularly late in the tenure, there was sort of a lot of patchwork and let's hope to get by with this guy. Let's hope to get by with that guy and particularly on defense. So is it a repeatable formula? Is it even a formula you'd want to emulate for these guys here in Vancouver? I think the latter part is sort of what I've been asking myself and that's not to knock Teddy Bluger or I, and I I'm, a big Ian Cole fan and what he brings. And, you know, I think he's got some tread left on his tires. I think the big thing that stands out to me is that a lot of the guys that they've grabbed from Pittsburgh are guys that Pittsburgh has sort of willingly walked from that. They got to the end of the line and felt like they couldn't get any further and went in different directions. And so Teddy Bluger ends up being a trade deadline guy last year. 
um, is in and out of the lineup in Vegas, smart player, good PK guy, couldn't score. And so it's like, all right, let's, let's, we, we know we need to give this guy a raise. We're probably not going to Vancouver steps up and is the team to do it. When you've got very specific needs, like Vancouver did this last off season, trying to, you know, fix that PK, I get it. There's a familiarity there. You know that this is a really smart player and you hope that maybe if you fit him into a mix differently that he can contribute some offense and and be a more complete player. Um, I like the Casey to Smith one because sometimes like it's an, it's an individual case by case basis. Like to Smith was, you know, the perfect asset to grab at a time when Montreal had four goalies and they knew him. They, they knew that he would fit comfortably with Demko. They have the same agents. Like there's a lot of, you know, sort of taking the jigsaw puzzle, spreading the pieces out on the table and trying to make everything fit, even though there might be some jagged edges. And that's sort of what the role has been for Patrick Alvin and, and, and Jim Rutherford since taking over is like, they kind of had to tear down a lot and kind of had to work through a lot of roster inefficiencies in a way that a lot of teams would just like to just wipe the slate clean and move forward. They had contracts and term and things that were ugly that were, you know, kind of putting them in a tough spot to start that it's like they finally, I think this past summer got to a baseline roster that they felt comfortable with for the first time. And now it will be continuing to move around those edges to improve. On the Garland front, some momentum seemed to be there on social media of all places. But in reality, do you feel like there's momentum in in the chase of that trade? I I personally don't. And and I when I say this, like I I also know that things can change with one phone call. Yeah. The teams that I've talked to actually like the player. And if he were in the last year of his deal. I think this would have been solved already a while ago. I think the issue is it's the term and that's not a secret. It's that teams are looking two and three years down the line. Even teams like take a Chicago, for instance, go look at their, their page on cap friendly. They don't have any guys under contract when Garland's in the last year of his deal for good reason, because they want to be building towards this is the Connor Bedard, um, you know, we're launching pad. This is the moment when we become a playoff team again. They're not going to just take on a Connor Garland and have him ham up their cap to get a pick back because it doesn't really help them right now. So uh, that's the sort of spot that the Canucks have been in is that um, they can try and find another piece that's out of place somewhere else whether it's Washington or whether it's San Jose or pick a team, it's just that the contracts aren't lining up that make it so that this can be an equally, I don't want to say dangerous, but an equally destructive trade for both teams is sort of how you have to set it up. Does Tyler Myers have any value? I actually think he does. I think... Anytime you have that kind of size and look, I've seen his first few games of the season. I understand why Canucks fans are up in arms. I actually watched him really closely the day I was there in, in camp. And I just was like, I feel like this guy is going to have a big year. And and maybe I was mistaken on that. Maybe there's been an o- over early season overreaction. Maybe not. Maybe it's just time. Um, I, I think much in the same way of Garland. And it's, it's really odd the circumstances that both of those two guys arrived almost from the very first day they got there, they felt like square pegs in round holes. And I don't know why that is because you would think that you'd be excited about signing a a marquee free agent, like a Myers or acquiring Garland and then extending him in a, in a sign in an extension shortly thereafter that I think you're looking at that and you go, why, why hasn't there been any comfortability? Both these guys have been on edge since day one. Uh, Garland has acknowledged it. Myers, whether he said it publicly or not has felt it. Um, But I do think that there's enough teams that are out there that are looking at their defense core saying, yeah, I don't, I could find it. I could find use for him. Um, you know, especially toward the bottom pairs on my team that 
you know, ask less of him instead of 20 minutes a night, let's That's give right. him 16 that, you know, maybe the return is better. And if you were chain at the trade deadline, I think the hope was Frank to get him to the trade deadline where you could retain at that point. Cause it's no skin off your back. Um, and, and then you can actually ask for something in return. The question is, can they afford to wait till the trade deadline? Do they need to make changes before then just to, to, to help get a, a true top four defenseman in there. But let's go back to what we were just talking about with how the Canucks have structured their roster. Say whatever you want about Tyler Myers, but he's still better than Friedman, still better than Juleson, mm-hmm. still better than Breezebois. Like, go through your depth chart, okay? And and maybe you kind of squinted at Breezebois, and I get it. Um, but I, I think the point is you want more bona fide NHL defensemen, not less. So what you'd be doing is then creating another problem to solve for, and maybe you can take that cap space and do it, but to think that you're going to pluck another top four defenseman from another team the way that you did last year with Philip Ronick, that doesn't come around all that often. You have to find a pretty unique scenario. And so what you don't want to do at the same time is cut the legs out from your team and their ability to compete for a playoff spot. Now that's what the Canucks are wrestling with. Yeah, I think we did. Uh, we looked at it before the Ronick acquisition, and I think it was something like six top four, or you could argue top four right shot defensemen moved in a calendar year uh, via trade and free agency and all of that. So and you're right. They are me, absolutely the scarcest commodity out there, and they are so difficult and expensive. Good ones, good ones, too. And let me tell you the backstory to the Ronick transaction because it came together in such an interesting and fascinating way that – The Red Wings had known from the Canucks, I don't know if it was the last six months or whatever it was, but the backstory is something like the Canucks had called about Hironic at a certain point and they were like, no, no, he's, you know, he's with us. He ain't going anywhere. And that, I forget, was it deadline day or the day before? I think it was a couple days before. A couple days before. The timeline is a little bit screwed up for me, but the call came from Detroit to Vancouver and it was, Hey, are you still interested in Philip Ronick? And the answer was yes. And then it was, okay, here's what we want. Say yes now. And I won't advertise him to anyone else. He's yours. And the Canucks knowing how difficult it is to make a transaction like that. We're like, boom, that's it. On the spot, Frank. They said yes. Pretty on much. The spot. It was like, hey, I'll call you back in, in 30 minutes. I need to talk it over with my group. This yeah. is what this is what we're doing. That's how much they knew that it's hard to do yeah. this. And mm-hmm. and remember the reaction in Vancouver? Everyone was like, look at how disjointed this is. You just took the pick from the Horvat trade. And like you didn't even like you you it was like burning all people thought it was like burning a hole in their pocket. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in reality, it was these types of guys are difficult to get your hands on. And when you get an opportunity to, you probably don't say no. Yeah. And, and we had mentioned it. The previous off season had come and gone with a bunch of right shot defensemen moving via trade. Um, and the Canucks weren't involved in that. And then the Canucks didn't draft one. And so it became the big question. And it was really the big question when Trevor Linden and Jim Benning were, was here. And it just perpetuated through the early Rutherford Alvin era is where are the defensemen particularly the right shot defensemen well the good ones gonna like, come from like even like frank even people are getting excited about guys like andrew peak who are fine national hockey league defensemen but not mm-hmm. top four national hockey league do the connects get better with andrew peak on the right side yes they get better but not like demonstrably they don't all of a sudden become like de facto playoff contenders here because they've got andrew peak like getting good top four right shot defensemen it just seems like it's a it's pie in the sky stuff you have to draft them That's Mm. really it. Like they so rarely become available that you have to draft them and develop them. And that's why I actually really commend the Canucks in the last calendar year. I think they've inched closer and I think they are a playoff team because of the changes that they've made getting to that. You can't solve for all the problems in one shot. It doesn't happen. And that patience drives fans crazy because they see other player movement and transactions out there and they say, well, why can't we do that? And it's cap space, it's assets and picks, it's 
who you have currently stacked up in your development roster. Like it, there's a lot that goes into it, but to shuffle out the non NHL defensemen and get them out of the mix and out of the lineup as best as they can was a big step forward for this team. Now it's about trying to continue to build and add on to it. And, and in fairness, Ronick's been great this year. Uh, you know, we wondered what he'd be like coming off the injury to a new, you know, obviously uh, more intense market. He's been fantastic. They just need I, Tom um, Willander and Hunter Verstevich yeah, to not they, be 18 yeah, years old. Do. They need them to be 21 right now and ready to pluck the fruit off the tree. That's I was going to say, and I don't want to add to anyone's anxiety, but now the problem is then you need to pay Philip. Now, Roy. yeah, now yeah, they need to pay him. Becomes have... this whole cycle over again. That's no, like, I know. I know. This is why he's not in Detroit anymore. It's not that they didn't like him. It was just no. that they need to commit dollars to people for the long term. Mo Sider, who's going to be our top paid. To, what Go down the list. You structure out your cap over a five to seven year period. And I think they made a determination that we just don't want to allot these dollars. Yeah. And if you look at the Canucks cap friendly page, they have like 30 million plus in cap space next year. But of course, Lee Patterson and Phil Pronick <laughs> yeah. are going to eat like two thirds of that. So, yeah. and uh, then you've got the OEL buyout ratcheting up. Like right, it's, right. It just, it doesn't ever end. Mm -hmm. Vicious cycle. Just lastly and quickly, I kind of like the fact that the NHL is draft. Uh, the NHL draft is different than the NBA and the NFL. I like watching the business on the floor with the GMs and all that. Blake needs a better TV show. Uh, these changes to the draft and teams doing it from their own HQ as opposed to the draft floor. Where's all that coming from? Why, why do they want to make these changes? Well, part of it stemmed from the idea that the league still hasn't nailed down a host spot because there's things booked in Vegas that week. And so the genesis of the conversation in the BOG meeting was, well, if we don't have a spot yet, why don't we consider just doing it in a decentralized way where everyone can be in their home war room and practice facility or arena and teams have found it incredibly disadvantageous having everyone 10 feet from everyone else trying to do what is arguably as we just talked about some of the most important business that they do all year long executing trades making sure that your your draft list and and where things are trending line up the way they should having the ability to have a conversation across a room um it it matters and so there's that part of it and then there's also the expense and human part of it of why are we taking 50 people in our organization and flying them to Nashville and then flying all 50 people back to our HQ to then have free agency in short order. And oh, by the way, all of our important prospects are getting on the ice for development camp. Everyone's hair is on fire for a 10 day period in time where no one can catch their breath. And that's not what the point is to catch their breath. It's more so, are we just better positioned for actually conducting business as opposed to worrying about what the optics look like? And I think the decentralized part is the way to go. I like having everyone together, but yeah. I just think. Do you think it'll happen for 2024 or is this a 25 thing? It's probably leaning towards 24, but there's a reason why they asked for these ballots to come back. It's a real simple check the box. Yes or no. Do you want it to be de decentralized or say the same? And it's due on Tuesday because they want to know, hey, do we have to go crazy getting a facility if maybe we're going to do it differently from the start? Mm. And if you Based can on... adapt in a pandemic, you can adapt now. Yes. You don't need to wait till 2025. Great stuff, Frank. Thanks for this. Until next Friday. See you guys. This Sakaris and Price clip brought to you by Applewood Auto Group. And remember, it's all good at Applewood.